This is Faith's Foundation, a course in Biblical Theology and Interpretation. And we always begin with prayer. And we pray the same two things. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So let's pray the Lord will grant us that through his spirit and his word. Let's pray. second thing we always pray is Jeremiah 315 I'll give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you on knowledge and understanding let's pray that for the pastors that they would be people after God's own heart that they would have knowledge and understanding to share with others let's also pray that for ourselves let's pray All right, before we get going too far, we have someone who has yet again completed all of the homework for Unit 6. Now, I'm running behind on this one, but he, re he recited all of the verses at the same time, so all of six of them at one time at the end of that. So, Miguel, if you would come up. We got something a little different from you this time, but thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. So much for uh, doing all that work, and may the Lord bless you as it uh, percolates in your mind. So, All right. Today we are in Unit 7, Lesson 5. What was Lesson 1 about? As in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where um, God's going to bless all the nations through Abraham. What was the second lesson about? Why should we be blessed out of Psalm 67? Both the spiritual blessings and the material blessings are uh, for the purpose of all the nations knowing the salvation of our God. So what was the third lesson about? Yeah, uh, it's in out Isaiah 52:10, where God is going to bear his holy arm in the sight of all the nations so that they shall see the salvation of our God. So we're seeing this common theme in the Old Testament that's starting to be filled up because in Isaiah 52 and 53, he starts saying what that salvation is as we talk about the suffering servant and what the servant's going to do, especially in chapter 53. Last week in Lesson 6, or excuse me, Lesson 4, we moved into Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. What was that about? The end of the age. The end of the age, right. Once this gospel of the kingdom is preached to all the nation, as a testimony to all the nations, then the end will come. So we know that, again, in the New Testament, that everything is going towards what was promised in the very beginning, that... All the families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. We know it's going to be what the servant, Jesus Christ, is going to do. And then once that is preached to all the nations, history is over. Because God will have completed everything that he was intending creation to complete. So once you finish your purpose, things come to an end. No reason for him to go on like that. So that's what we saw last week. This week we're going to talk about Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus Great Commission is what this is normally referred to. The memory verse is Acts 1-8, and who can say that for us? Okay. There you go. Very good. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. All right. Now, anytime you're going to properly interpret a text, what is the first thing you do? The context. You want to see what's taking place so you don't take something out of context, but whatever you're saying or learning from the text is... Uh, in the context that we're looking at. Second thing you do with the text is observation. observation. You see what is actually written in the text. That's uh, in the text. That's one of the things that 
I really want us to pay attention to today because of some of the um, misunderstandings of the Great Commission that uh, we've come across. Once you know the context and observation, what's the third thing you do? You look for the main point. You put the context, which is the big picture, observation, which is the details, put them together, and you get the main point. Once you know the main thing that God is teaching in any text, what do you do? You apply it. You respond to God and what he's teaching in a way that is appropriate to what he is saying. Once you have applied it to your life, then what do you do? Share you share it with someone else. Correct. All right. We are going to look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20. I'll go ahead and read that so we'll know what we're looking for. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right. Now, the first thing we do is context. <laughs> and we're looking at verses 16 through 20. Uh, I'll take it back a little bit further. But what comes before verse 18? What is verses 16 and 17 talking about? Yeah, so the disciples do what it is that Jesus says after his resurrection. They go to the place where Jesus told them to go. They're meeting with him, some worship, some doubt, but they're all together there at the end of this um, gospel. Yeah, that is the 11. That is what? The 11 disciples. The 11 disciples is specifically mentioned in verse 16, correct. So it's not just all the disciples, but it's the 11, so the 12 minus Judas Iscariot. What comes after verse 20? Huh? Yeah, Mark comes after that, so <laughs> really not too much. How does, it, how does the text fit into the context? So you, th you say it, you think it connects with Mark in the sense that Mark is action oriented, yes. he's always doing and, and stuff like that? Okay. And you just jumps right in. Yeah. 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 I would disagree with that because um, it's the end of the book. So it really doesn't have connection to what's coming next as far as keeping it in the context of what's going on. Yes. Yeah, I heard you say. <laughs> Yes. Yes, I understand what you're saying. I would still, when you're interpreting the text of uh, Matthew 28, 16 through 20, Mark is not going to have an influence on that. So I would say it, it doesn't have any influence. <laughs> All right, yeah. I was going to say there's nothing written after that. Right. So there's nothing after that. So what comes after really doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, these are Jesus' last words before he ascends to the Father. There's really no connection to the next book. This is the end of what Matthew wrote. But it is the last thing that is written in Matthew, the last thing that he is doing. So that's really how it fits. Jesus calls them together, tells them to meet. They meet together, and then he gives the last words that he is speaking on earth. Okay. He's going to be with us to the end of the age, and then the age starts. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Good. 
All right, next thing we do is observation. So who is speaking? Jesus, correct. To whom is he speaking? The 11 disciples. The 11 disciples, correct. What has been given to Jesus? All authority. All authority in heaven and on earth, correct. In verse 19, what is the first thing Jesus tells the disciples? Go. Go, correct. In verse 19, what are the disciples supposed to do after they go? Make disciples, correct. Of whom are disciples supposed to be made? All the nations. All the nations. What is the next thing the disciples are to do in verse 19? Baptize correct. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What is the command of verse 20? Teach them. Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Correct. What is Jesus' promise to the disciples in verse 20? To be with them. When will Jesus be with the disciples? Always. Even to the end of the age. Correct. All right. Any other questions about the text? Mm-hmm. So the nations, is he talking the nations that they knew or the nations that we know, the application being for us as well as for them? Uh, we'll get into that to a little bit. I think it's more broader. I think it's broader than that. Okay. I think it's just the idea of because the whole earth. Ethnos. Yes, okay. the term is actually ethnos or ethnicities. Yeah. So yes, it would be to the ones that they were aware of, but the further out you go, you become more aware of more of them. So until you reach all of them, Correct. 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 So, again, the, the idea here is, is going to encompass all the peoples, all the nations of the earth. Yes. Well, he says that because the Lord is the God of the earth. Yes. So that means that what they knew was just kind of like around them, but there was like other yes. people groups and stuff somewhere else. Correct. To, to the, uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Out of most parts of the earth. Correct. Any other questions about the text? All right. Next thing we do is we put the context and that together, and we find the main point. So what is the main point of verses 18 through 20? We did not bring that back. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just go ahead and say your main point. I'll try to. Go and, go and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all that Christ has commanded you, and Jesus will be with you always. Yes. Basically, a restatement of the text. First question, is it true? Yes. Is it in the text? Yes, because it's a restatement of the text. Number three, I cannot make a three anymore. Three <laughs> is, uh, is it the main point of the text? Yeah, it is. So, very good. Okay, what did you say? Go and make disciples of all nations. That'd work. That'd work, yeah. I cut mine down, too. I said Jesus commissions his disciples to make disciples of all the nations. And all three of us, we got the main point. We're, we're talk the main point is the making of disciples and of all the nations. That's really the, the center of it. That's the emphasis of the text itself. Now, let's kind of walk through some of this. I am going to take you back a little bit further in the context. Um, notice in verse 6, Jesus, or an angel is talking to the women who came to see Jesus uh, at the tomb, and the angel says, He is not here, for he is risen. Okay, so we know the resurrection is taking place. Then down in verse 9, said Jesus met them, the same ladies who came there. He greeted them. They came up and took hold of his feet, and what? They worshipped him, correct. Now, if we go over into our context in verse 17, Jesus tells the 11 to come. They meet with him. Uh, 
And when they see him, what do they do? They worship him. Why is it, some doubt? Why is that important? Well, do y'all remember back in Matthew chapter four in the temptation, same same gospel, when Satan comes to Jesus and he says, "If you will simply fall down and worship me, I'll give you all the nations of the earth." And what was Jesus' response? You shall worship, you shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. The ladies come and worship Him. He doesn't rebuke them. The disciples come and worship him. He does not rebuke them. What does that mean? He's God. But also after the resurrection. After the resurrection. The plan of salvation has been completed and he's now God. Ah, be careful here. He wasn't God after the resurrection. He was fully man and fully God while he was on the earth. From the time he was born, from the time he was conceived, he was fully God and fully man. He was worshipped before that, and he never rebuked the people of that, even before. That. Yeah. Exactly. He was worshipped before then. I can't remember a reference right off, but I... Yeah, I know, but there's several yeah. instances where people who were just... But we do have to be careful with this particular thing, because there are many people who will say Jesus became God at this point, and they would say he was not God while he was on the earth and this is one of the things that they will use to talk about uh, him not being fully God and fully man or not being um, he might they would look at him as the son of God as opposed to God the son okay yes yeah in Colossians all things are created through him both visible and invisible and so again he is God the Son before creation because all of creation came into being through him. So he did not become God. He has always been God the Son. So he has never become God. Now he just took on human flesh at the time of Mary when he was conceived in the womb of Mary. And that's when he became fully God and fully man at that point. Okay, yes. Yes, he did not attain Godhood. He had always been God, and he, had, he continued that. So. Did the completion of the resurrection make a difference? There is a whole lot of answers to yes to that, so I need to talk to you a little bit more later about that. But he did not necessarily become something that he had not been before in that he was still fully God his human body was transfigured at that point and we know because like in Luke for example he just appears in places and then disappears and they didn't recognize him when they were walking on the road of Emmaus and things like that so there was a transfiguration of his earthly body being perfected but he was still fully God and fully man and he did still have the holes in his hands and everything so yes that is definitely a rabbit but that's okay <laughs> it is something that needs to be clarified so all right um, Jesus when he comes back when he's resurrected everything does change in the sense that they are worshiping him he does not rebuke them and it's showing that he is God. Why is that important? Because the first thing he says here in our text, in verse 18, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And again, some people will say this is when Jesus attained Godhood, but that's not true. If you go back to Philippians chapter 2, for example, it talks about where Jesus emptied himself. Okay, you remember that? Ephesians chapter 2, let's just, uh, excuse me, Philippians chapter 2. I'll just go there for a second so we can. Philippians chapter 2. Have this attitude in yourselves, which also is in Christ Jesus. That's uh, chapter 2, verse 5. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on the cross 
For this reason, this is also important, verse 9, uh, Philippians 2, 9. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what happened when Jesus became man, took on human flesh, is he emptied himself of all the prerogatives of being God. Okay? Once he is resurrected having accomplished everything that God wanted the father wanted him God the father wanted him to do God then the father bestowed on him all authority in heaven and on earth we can also see this in well just turn over again Ephesians um if I can find it Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. And he put all things, that is the Father, put all things in subjection under his feet, that's Jesus' feet, and gave him, that's Christ, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You can also see this in Colossians chapter 2, as well as in Romans something. And uh, also Peter talks about what once he has been resurrected, once he has fulfilled everything that the Father wanted him to accomplish while in human flesh, and he was resurrected, God, because of, like Philippians says, because of his willing humility and submission to the Father's will, he then, the Father then gives him authority over everything. Okay? That is what is saying here, as well as in those other verses. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So he is taking back all the rights and privileges and prerogatives that he had laid aside previously to become man, to take on human flesh. And he is now in that position that he was previously. Like he prays in um, John 17 father glorify me with the glory with which I had before and the father says I have glorified it and I will glorify it again and so what he's done is he has gotten that all of that back that he had laid down previously was returned to him Does that make sense okay now that's important here because that's what Jesus starts with and I want us to recognize in this context in one to three years, we usually say three years that Jesus did ministry on the earth. Think about this now. This is good for us to remember too. Jesus lived 30 years in obscurity. And then he has one to three years. We say three years because there's three mentions of the uh, Passover in the Gospel of John. So therefore, we, uh, it's only mentioned once in the other three Gospels, but it's mentioned three times in John. So they said, well, it probably took place over the course of three years. So one to three years, Jesus comes, accomplishes everything, and he's done. 30 years of preparation, three years ministry, boom. Think about that in your own life, by the way. <laughs> it's not like everything has to be filled up for 50 years of, you know, meaningful stuff that you're doing God may be preparing you for 60 years for two years of ministry who knows but anyway that's a side note Jesus accomplished everything okay he's been resurrected he says I want you to, you disciples to come and meet with me and I want you to realize that from this point on I am not going to be here that's what Jesus is saying I'm not going to be here you're not going to hear my voice anymore physical voice you're not going to see me touch people and they are healed or raised from the dead you're not going to hear me speak people being healed you're not going to hear me casting out demons you're not going to hear me verbally teaching you anything anymore I'm going to be resurrected I'm going to go and be with the father this is a very important point in the life of Jesus and of the disciples because especially the way that Matthew is written, this is the end of the gospel for Matthew. He said, this is the last thing Jesus is going to say on the face of the earth. What is he going to say? It's going to be important. And he says, all authority 
has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What's that? Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Okay, this is the last thing that Jesus says. That is important. But it really shouldn't surprise us. Because just like we went over, we saw at the very beginning, as soon as God starts to make for himself a people with Abraham, the first thing he promises him, or in the first thing he talks to him, is that all the families of the earth will be blessed. Through him, we know from Psalm 67 that our spiritual and physical blessings are for the purpose of the nations knowing the salvation of the Lord. We know from Isaiah 52.10 that he is going to demonstrate his salvation in the sight of all the nations. We know from Matthew 24, 14, that once this gospel uh, has been uh, proclaimed as a testimony to all the nations, then the end will come because the purpose has been accomplished. So everything we see in Scripture is pointing toward this, and then Jesus is leaving, and he says the same thing. Go and make disciples of all the nations. That shouldn't be surprising to us. It's not like it's a new thing. It's a continuation of what God started in the, in the beginning and what he's going to continue doing until the end of time. And it's ba- the end of time is based on this being fulfilled. Okay? So it really shouldn't be all that surprising for us. However, what do we normally hear when we hear the Great Commission. First thing that is very common is go, and they say, that can be translated as you are going. No, nah, that's not really a good translation. They're using a, a tense that we do not have in English, so it's really hard to translate. But it's not even the emphasis here. It's not as you are going, because the normal way that I have heard that taken is as you are going, preach the gospel. That is, you need to go out and do evangelism. And as you're going, do that. If we are only doing evangelism while we are going, will the nations be reached? No. What's the difference between an evangelist and a missionary? An evangelist proclaims the gospel to people in their own language, in their own culture. A missionary is someone who crosses barriers. They cross distance, they cross language, they cross culture in order to preach the gospel to other people not like them. If we only do it as we're going, the nations will not be reached. There has to be an element where there are people who are called and gifted by God to cross those barriers in order to proclaim the gospel to people that are not like them. They're not of the same ethnicity. They're not of the same language, not of the same culture, so that all of them can be reached. Second thing is, this is where the observation comes in. What does Jesus tell the people to do? What is the main emphasis of this text? Go and what? Make disciples. disciples. What is the difference between preach the gospel, evangelize, and make disciples? Yes, you spend time with them and you teach them. We many times say the great commission is to go and preach the gospel. That's partially true. We should preach the gospel to it. We should preach the gospel to all the nations and all the families. That is not the emphasis of the text. That is not the emphasis of what God is saying here. The emphasis of what Jesus Christ tells his disciples at the last thing he does on earth is to go and make disciples of the nations. Now, I really want to emphasize this because I think we overemphasize in the other direction, which is a misunderstanding of what's being said here. Many times the emphasis, and I've made this in the last few lessons, the emphasis is on evangelism. Go and preach the gospel. And I in no way want to put that down. We must do that. That's the first step in making disciples. You have to proclaim the gospel to people who do not know Jesus Christ. Has to take place. We have to do it. Okay? But the problem is that's just the first step. And it is not the emphasis of what's being said here. The emphasis is make 
disciples. What does that mean? Well, Jesus defines it in verse 20. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. That's Jesus' definition of disciple-making. Now, look at that. This is exactly what you're talking about in taking time with people, and I think it's a huge area that we do not engage properly. First thing is, you teach them everything that Jesus has commanded. How many of us know everything that Jesus commanded? We all should. We should know the Gospels inside and out. We should know the letters of Paul inside and out. Because unless we do, we can't teach it to people. And yet Jesus' command is to make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. If we don't know it, we can't teach it. So the first thing we have to do is we have to know everything that Jesus commands. Second thing, not only do we have to know it, we have to be able to do it. Because knowledge itself will not transform. Do you realize when we, every week when we start this, when we uh, pray, we pray that we'd have knowledge and understanding. And for a purpose, that we will be transformed. Knowledge itself will not do that. There must be a transformation that takes place. That's what we're looking at. So first we have to know everything that Jesus commands. Then we have to do everything that Jesus commands. Then we're in a position to train others to what? What does he say in the text? Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And then verse 20, teaching them to observe. What does that mean? Obey. To do it. That's right. To, to obey. To do what he says. Back when I was in the 11th grade, a friend of mine, said, do you know how to work on this part of the car? I said, yes. He said, have you ever done it? I said, no. He said, then you don't know how to do it. And he was right. <laughs> I never did do it. I knew it in my head, but I hadn't done it, so I didn't really know how to do it. Same thing with the gospel. We have to know it, but that's just the first step there. We have to practice it so that we can teach others how to observe it as well as ourselves. Because otherwise, we have knowledge, but we really don't have understanding. We don't have a transforming power in us that we can help other people to also observe all that Jesus commanded. And one of the key things here, this takes time. That's one of the things that you brought up that is so important. We have, we're Americans, and as Americans, we want everything to be fast and efficient. What are Americans known for? The assembly line. We will crank out more of the same thing than anybody in the world, and it will look exactly the same as the one that came before it. That's what we like, and it's done fast. We can produce it. That's not the gospel. It's not taking one presentation of the gospel, giving it to every single person that you meet, whatever their language, whatever their culture, and then expecting that to be discipleship. That's not what Jesus says. And that's the other thing that we also push, at least in our organization, our group, because you can quantify numbers. And again, that's an American thing. That's an efficient thing. When I was pastoring... You turn in a sheet that says how many are baptized, how many additions to the church, or losses to the church, and you, you know how much have you given, these all things, and they quantify it by numbers. And you, are, and you are seeing whether you are a success or not as a pastor as to how the numbers look. Well, none of us want to be failures, so we want good numbers. And we think the higher the number, the more success we've had. That's not necessarily true. We have gone to places... One of the places where we worked, and they said, we have churches planted in 70 places, 70 villages where there are new church plants. Within two months after that guy leaving and us coming in, it was down to 16. Within, we, we started talking to people and saying, what's going on here? They didn't know the gospel. 
They thought the gospel was being healed, and as soon as they got sick, they turned away from Jesus. But you can come back to America and start saying, we got new churches in 70 villages being reached. And everyone's like, yay, yay, that's so great. It's not reported, well, actually, 12 of them have actually stuck. Why? Well, one, when we're coming back, we want to encourage people to reach the ends of the earth and see God's doing stuff. But the other end, we also, mixed in with that, we want to be seen as successful. We have to stop that mentality. We have to start having a mentality of what actually is success. And success is making disciples, teaching them to observe all that God, that Christ has commanded. And that takes time. You have to get in people's lives and get messy. It's not handing a tract. It's not giving five steps to becoming a Christian. This is, I'm going to tell you the gospel. I'm going to tell you the whole gospel. I'm going to get into your life. And together, as a church, we're going to disciple one another. Because quite frankly, I don't know everything about Christ and what he has commanded. And neither do you. I need you. You need me. That's the way God organized it. So that we're discipling one another because otherwise we'll come along and we'll start exalting one person and putting down another person instead of recognizing every single one of us is necessary for us to become who God has called us to be. Yes. Yeah, everywhere you go, you, you see it. Yes. Yes. Yes, they don't live a godly life. We don't know if they're believers or not. They've prayed to receive Christ, and then who knows? Because what we really have to focus on is, are you a disciple? And the proof of that is, how are you living? Are you observing all that Christ has commanded you? And quite frankly, a lot of us have to take responsibility ourselves in that what we are focused on is that initial step instead of the end result. Instead of making disciples, we want to say, get, get them into the kingdom, that's all. Well, you don't know unless they're disciples. Unless they endure to the end, you don't know if that prayer or beginning step was actually real. It's only proven by the life of discipleship. And we have to take on the responsibility of saying, we are going to get into the lives of people and make sure they observe and know everything that Christ has commanded. That's our goal. That's the command. That's what we need to regain. Because if we don't, in the words of A.W. Tozer, will it not be seen that many of our supposed gains are simply losses spread out over a larger area? Now, he was talking the concept of the majesty of God. But it's true. Because there will be many people who say, oh, yes, I prayed a prayer to do this, but they have not been taught everything that Jesus has commanded. They have not been taught to observe everything that Jesus has commanded. And they have no understanding of Christ and his ways and his gospel. And a lot of them are going to come before the Lord, just like we see in Matthew 24 and 25. They're going to come before the Lord and say, Oh, Lord, welcome. And he's going to say, Depart from me. I never knew you. Because we got the end goal wrong. We have to take responsibility for that, and we have to take responsibility to change that. And here's a good place for me to interject this question. Are you making disciples? If you're not, start. And I know a lot of people say, well, I'm not qualified for that. You are if you're a believer. If you don't feel qualified, get qualified. Start reading the scripture. Start studying it. Know it. Understand it. Pray that God will help you to know and to observe everything that Jesus commanded. And then you start passing that on. 
Now, another important point is, it's not that you have to do this perfectly to know and understand perfectly and practice it perfectly before you do this. Okay? If I have sin, like lust or anger or pride or uh, gossiping or you name it, and I haven't overcome that yet, that does not preclude me from telling you, don't do it. It's sin. Overcome it. And I'll help you. Because quite frankly, none of us are going to overcome all those things in this life. If we wait until we do, we'll never make disciples. Just look at some of these characters that are the 11 disciples. They weren't perfect, <laughs> but they were obedient. They took to heart what it was that Christ taught. They were observing it, and they were sharing it with others, making disciples. That's the first thing. Second thing is very important. Make disciples of whom? All individuals? Nations. Again, we have to remember what is being said here. Because we can get into the mindset that, well, I am going to reach my neighborhood and then we're good. If we just reach our neighborhood, will that reach the nations? No. And therefore, it will not be in accord with what Christ is teaching. The emphasis is nations. Every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, every family of the earth, that's what we see. That needs to be our goal. Do we reach everyone around us? Absolutely. But the end goal is not just our circle, but the ends of the earth. That has to be the motivating factor. And we can't lose sight of that. It has to be a worldwide, global focus if we are to be obedient to what Jesus is saying here. We are to make disciples of all the nations. And again, that goes contrary to what many times we're, we're told. Because we as pastors focus on the church over which we are given the, what's the word I'm looking for? Shepherdhood. <laughs> okay? So we're focused on the people that we can make disciples with, and many times because of that, we lose sight of the end goal, which is all the nations. Those two are not mutually exclusive. They go together. We do reach people here. But part of our church being healthy is we are sending others. We are supporting others. We are constantly looking to the ends of the earth and how we are engaged as a local body in reaching all the families of the earth. Yes. Jesus said make disciples. But we take making disciples as a secondary step after conversion. Yes. Jesus did not separate into two steps. First you convert. Yes. Then Yes. Yes. And we need to be thinking that from the beginning. When we are sharing the gospel with people, we are making disciples. This is making disciples. Discipleship happens from before conversion. Yes. The first conversation with people, that's the beginning of yes. the making of disciples. It doesn't start after conversion. That was great. There's a lot there. I can't say it all for the people who can't hear you. However, <laughs> it was really good in that She's saying it's not like you have evangelism being separate from disciple-making. The first step in disciple-making is you tell them the gospel so they become a follower of Christ, and then you teach them to observe everything that Christ has done. It's one thing. And, and as you also said, it begins even before that as the Holy Spirit starts working on them. But what we have to do is we have to see the whole thing together as a whole that my obligation is to share the gospel in order to make disciples and that's a process not just I'm going to do this one step and then I'm going to move on does that make sense? now I think I got the gist of everything you were saying yeah it's not two steps it's just one 
thing. Making disciples starts with evangelism and moves on. Correct. All right. It is for all the nations, and we cannot get away from that. And again, the mindset that we have many times, it's hard for us to focus on the whole world. I can focus on people I know. I can love people I know. But it's very hard for me to focus on the world, people around the world that I've never met. I've never been to Bangladesh. It's hard for me to pro focus on people from Bangladesh and saying every people group ought to be reached there. That's difficult. But we still need to do it. We need to pray for God to send people there. We need to pray for the people groups in order for them to be reached. We need to see about are there people in our church that God is calling and gifting to go overseas and to reach all these families and people groups. We need to be engaged as a church as well as individuals in making disciples of all the nations. Yes, make disciples here. Yes, do evangelism here. Focus is also how does that fit into the big scheme of the world being reached and the disciples of all the nations. That's the real issue. Okay, any question about that so far? We also have baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We've covered baptism before, so just a brief word on that. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three. It's not just in Jesus' name, as some would say. Baptism, a very important part of that. Again, as we have seen, when, when we are overseas and people come to Christ, the real crucial part is baptism. Because once they are baptized, there is a spiritual war going on many times up until the point of baptism where they can still kind of, no, I'm not going to do that. Once they are baptized, there is a significant break with all that comes before. And they are now identified with Christ. Baptism does not save you. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying is that is a public statement to where you have, it's kind of like a, uh, I like to call it like a wedding ceremony. You know, you are making a public expression of your love for the one you are marrying in the wedding ceremony. Officially, legally, the wedding ceremony does not marry you in America. It's signing the little piece of paper where you're legally married. But the ceremony is your public declaration of love. You're telling everyone before God, I'm entering to a covenant with this person. I'm not going to have any more boyfriends or any more girlfriends. This is the only relationship I'm going to be on from now on until one of us or both of us die. That's it. Okay, and that entering into a covenant is similar to what baptism is. You're entering into that covenant with God. There is a break with your old life. You are now saying, I'm serving the Lord God only from here on out and I'm not going to toy around with all these other things that try to do it and when he's and that's one of the reasons that is in this there is a separation in that time there are many many gods that were around and there is a separation when you're baptized in the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit you're making that commitment you're not serving the other gods you're serving uh, the Lord alone and that's it yes Mm -hmm. it's, it's part and parcel of the one event. And I think that we have lost the immediate and immediate and spiritual spiritual aspect of baptism by having it and making it a part of the church and making it the decision that we do get to be baptized and we don't mm, get to be baptized good. Yeah. rather than understanding that Jesus said, when they come to me, this happens right then. Yeah. So if you couldn't hear, she's talking about baptism happens immediately in Scripture on a profession of faith in Christ. And we say, yes, I want to follow Christ. Immediately they're baptized. It's not a function of the church in the sense that I have to come here to this building and I have to have the pastor as the one who has to put me under whether or not I can be and decide whether or not I should be baptized. Right, well, not the pastor. But instead, it is one of the things where you accept Christ. All right, let's get baptized. That's what we're commanded to do. So... Yes. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and if you couldn't hear, uh, now saying that he's seen baptism that probably shouldn't or couldn't, may not, should have taken place uh, because a lot of baptism, you have been baptized or, yeah, I became a Christian 10 years ago. Let's go ahead and get that, which is kind of a numbers thing again. Or there are some people, yeah, let's do this, and then later they fall away. And that's one of the reasons, again, we say baptism does not save. Okay, we have to make that clear. Another reason that some people do wait is so that you can talk to them about what do you really believe? Is it in accord with what Scripture teaches? Do you understand the gospel before they're baptized to make sure they understand what they're getting into? Another good reason to do that. Uh, I think a lot of this is also solved when we change our mindset of we're here to make disciples. Uh, because when we get into that mindset, I think that also affects how we are presenting the gospel so that they will understand the gospel before they make the decision to um, be baptized. So I think these all go together. So, yeah, good point, though. All right. Um, anyway, baptism isn't important enough apart that this is one of the things that Jesus mentions right here at the very end before he's over. Interestingly, I should have gone with this uh, earlier, but it goes with this next verse as well. Matthew likes sandwiches. Did y'all know that? Matthew likes sandwiches. That is, he'll put two parallel things, and then he'll put some meat in the middle of it. For example, in Matthew chapter 1, um, I forget which verse it is, 23 or something like that, it says, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Chapter 1. Last thing he says here in verse 2, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And you will be called God with us, and he says, I will be with you. This is again Jesus saying, I am, along with the worshiping we, we mentioned, this is God, uh, Jesus saying, I am God. I will be with you. Okay? And that is a very important part because... When we look at the nations, there are thousands of people groups who do not have the gospel. Maybe not even a single believer. Don't have the Bible in their own language. Okay? There are millions, if not billions, of people in those people groups which are unreached or unengaged and unreached. How in the world can we do that? Because we're not just talking about, I'm going to teach you math. Math is easy. One plus one equals two, right? Now, I'm not getting into the calculus or the easy stuff, okay? But we are talking about transformation. We're talking about going from spiritual death to spiritual life. And he says, I want you to do this for the nations and make disciples of the nations. How in the world can we do that? There's only one way. What was the memory verse today? Acts 1 8. You shall receive power when my spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Uttermost parts of the earth. That sounds familiar. We're to make disciples of all the nations. How are we going to do it? The Holy Spirit's going to come on us. It's the only way it can take place. This is the power of God at work. Now, in everything that God does, we have to remember two things. One, God is the one who does the work in everything. It's not us. God does the work, period. Second thing is, we are working in conjunction with what God is doing. That is, God is the one who is at work. He works through us. Okay? We have to remember that. 
I cannot make disciples of the nations. God can. And he can work through me to accomplish that. And that's the only way that this is going to be accomplished. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. The only way anyone will come to Christ is through the Holy Spirit. The only way anyone is going to be a disciple is through the power of the Holy Spirit. The only way the nations are going to be disciples is through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so important here when he says, I will be with you always. That is not simply Jesus saying, be comforted, I'm going to be with you, though that's a part of it. In the context that he's talking about, he's saying, make disciples of the nations and don't worry about it because I'm with you. You can do this because I am the one doing the work. I am with you. Yes. <coughs> Nations and people groups. I kind of switch back and forth. I use all of them interchangeably. Um, that's me. And if you look in Revelation 5, 9, Revelation 7, 9, it's every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Uh, we've already seen in Genesis that it is the families of the earth. We've seen the nations in uh, Psalms and also in Isaiah uh, and Matthew 24. And nations is here. All of these are going to be reached as people groups, okay? A people group, you have, eth there are different words, uh, and we've talked about this before, but an ethnos is an ethnicity, is a people, a culture together. A language, of course, is a language group, uh, like an English-speaking or Spanish-speaking or uh, Hindi-speaking or something like that. What you have... Uh, hmm? what word you the word here is ethne, which is ethnicity. That's literally what the nations is translated here. So it's not a political boundary. Okay, in Matthew, yeah, Matthew 28, is it 18? 19, 19. It's uh, <laughs> very well known for us. Ponte ta ethne, all the nations, all the ethnicities are going to be reached. So we're not talking political boundaries here. Okay. All right, where was I? Yeah. Well, be ethnicity, nation, tongue, or whatever, right? that would be a part of it. Again, we're talking about, we talked about this before, but families in the sense of uh, not like you and your children and your parents, but families in the sense, in a larger sense, which would be closer to ethnicity. In that, like all the sons of Abraham are part of the family of Abraham because it's going back so many generations. But we would call them an ethnicity or a you could call them a race or however you want to delineate that. So a family would be a larger group because you also said tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Tribe would be a smaller section of that, one of each one of the 12 sons of Abraham. So it's broken down to a smaller group. So, and again, these words are fluid. And I mean, each of them have their individual meaning, but they're all kind of combined, especially in Revelation at the end. And it's talking about all the... Uh, families, it's talking about ethnicities, it's talking about language groups, all of these are going to be represented before, before the Lord. But it's interesting because if you go to a, a ethnicity group mm -hmm. or a tribe or whatever you want to call it, there's family there. Yeah. I mean, they're, yeah. they're family part of the families of the earth. Yeah. 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 So, interesting study though. Go look at it and see, and see what the differences are for yourself. That's an interesting study to do. Yeah. Well, Yeah. About to make sure that the gospel reaches all the different groups that are within those groups. Right, right. And it's important for us to understand. Right. Like I said, it's, it's not political boundaries. It's ethnicities, literally. Ethnos, ethnicity, comes from, that, from the Greek word. So not a political boundary, not like the United States, as much as what's the ethnicity of the people. So, all right. I actually did the uh, application. Making disciples means we not only tell the good news, we are to teach them to observe all that I've commanded is to do this. We ourselves must first know what Jesus taught. And once we know what Jesus taught, we must practice it. Once we do this, we teach other people what Jesus said and help them, instruct them, and observe Jesus' teachings. And again, the, the idea that we have here is all of us working together. 
all of us discipling one another. It's kind of like just an interconnected web of discipleship that's taking place. Okay, we're all learning from one another the things that God has taught us from the Word through the Spirit. And that way we can all become more healthy. All right? Any other questions or comments? Yeah. It's interesting that the end I was thinking, that was really good. You know, the Jesus just said, yeah. Well, <laughs> Yeah. 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 No, oh, he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> but I realized that he had been telling them from yes. the very beginning. Yes. You know, this is going to happen. Do this, do that. You know. So yeah. Basically, the relationship was already constructed and built up. Yeah. And all he had to say just what he said. Yeah. In the end, it was short, short and sweet. He, yeah. ar they already, he's already taught them everything in the three years or whatever they've been. Right together and now he says now go make disciples yeah. do what I did I've I've blazed the trail I've, I've done everything follow my example start making disciples do what I did that's another interesting thing I'll just throw in here Jesus never asked us to do anything he didn't do himself and so he always he and he does it first to show us how to do it and so he's already done that all right don't forget do your memory verse, do the lesson for class, share the lesson with at least two others, and read at least three to four chapters of the Bible every day so you can get through the scripture in one year. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for all that you have done. Thank you so much that you are working with us and through us to accomplish all of your good purposes. And I pray that you would help us to have that mindset that we truly would have the end goal of making disciples of all the nations at the the core of everything we do uh, together with you and in our lives that we would have our lives aligned with your purposes so that we would know the joy of accomplishing what you want accomplished and your great purpose in history and in the world for we pray it in the name of Jesus and to the praise of your glory amen